Hi, my name is Frank Schaefer. May I preach you a Christmas New Year's sermon? My father was a minister who became a famous evangelical leader who, alongside me as his nepotistic sidekick, helped push the evangelical movement to the far right because of our, quote, stand on abortion. And I've spent the last 40 years regretting that and doing everything I can, including writing the memoir, Crazy for God, explaining from my point of view, as a fly on the wall in all the significant meetings that took the evangelical movement to the far right with President Reagan, two presidents, Bush, Ford, and many others that we knew and worked with. And I wrote about this. My perspective, therefore, as someone who has been part of the hard evangelical right, and then who left that movement, and to the surprise of some, as I talk about in my memoir, Crazy for God, it wasn't because of some embittering moment where I decided my parents or my religion or my God had failed me. It was the opposite. And that was that my parents' humble ministry of Libri Fellowship that they started in 1954 was so different in its welcome of the stranger, in its kindness to the gay women and men who came to the ministry, in their open-handedness to what we used to call non-believers, agnostics, atheists, Jews, Roman Catholics, who, by the way, at that time, we did not count as, quote, real Christians. But it was in contrast to the ministry I was raised in when I saw big-time American religion, the Pat Robertsons, the Jerry Falwells, all these others who I knew. Jerry Falwell lent me his jet, by the way, to fly around the U.S. on speaking engagements where I was the keynote speaker at the Southern Baptist Convention one year to 23,000 pastors. I spoke from Jerry Falwell's pulpit at Liberty Baptist uh, three times um, from his church and also at the college. I was really part of the 1970s, 1980s radicalization of the Republican Party. And I left that. And when I wrote my novel Portofino, which I was very lucky in that it was well-reviewed and became an international success, I was given permission to try to do something besides being the nepotistic sidekick to my father and or thrashing around in Hollywood directing low-budget feature films that I talk about in my memoir. And it was a new lease on life, a new spiritual lease on life as well, because I was able to see myself and what I was doing as apart from the movement into which I had been raised and groomed and conditioned which was fundamentalist evangelical Christianity. And so began a long spiritual journey that I've talked about in my books and in my commentaries and so forth. But the result, and why I'm mentioning this today, is that it has given me a rather unique perspective on American politics. I'm someone on the left. I am a liberal progressive. I vote for Democrats who nevertheless not only understands the religious right and has been warning people about the direction it has pulled America into in terms of desiring a Christian nationalist theocracy to replace democracy. It's what made Donald Trump president. But I understand it from the inside. But more than that, I value the evangelical Christianity I was raised with in a way that a lot of political commentators do not. They don't understand it. For me, it starts with the reaction of the evangelical community I was born into, Libri Fellowship, in caring for my wife, Jeannie, and I when we were 17 and 18, and I had gotten Jeannie pregnant. And we have been married now for 53 years. I have three grown children, five grandchildren, and I've done a lot of child care, not just for my children with my wife when I was very busy running around doing all sorts of things, and she bore the typical female load of primary child caregiver. But in the time of my grandchildren, I have been carrying that equally with her and these days doing most of the child care for my youngest three grandchildren, who I pick up and care for and cook for and all the other things that typically people associate with what maybe grandmothers do. And I find so much joy in that. 
But the perspective that I have, I guess, embraced most now is longing for more generosity of spirit. And this is where the sermon comes in. You know, the other day I did a podcast with um, Tim Alberta talking about his book, The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory, that I have here with all the notes, some of which, most of which I was unable to get through in the podcast with him, American Evangelicals in an Age of Extremism. And Tim has written a very generous and lovely open-hearted book because he has written the most damning critique of the white nationalist, evangelical nationalist movement, the Christian nationalist movement that's ever been written. He is an evangelical Christian from the inside. And uh, what was interesting to me is the fact that Tim is not only still an evangelical Christian, but his critique of evangelicalism is not from the point of view, the typical secular point of view of the left, you know, what you might call the New York Times view of the world, that the left is somehow more enlightened and we need to move past religion altogether and our faith should be in science and so forth, which, by the way, kind of describes where I'm coming from these days. Um, but Tim writes as an insider who is trying to call people back to a more generous interpretation of Christianity, a defense of the faith as Christ-centered and open what was interesting to me in, in people watching this and some of the comments online, uh, many people loved his presentation and, and my interview, but there was one that stuck out in my mind. Someone said something to the effect that, you know, I was listening to and enjoying it, but as soon as Tim said such and such, some line about religion, of course, I just quit watching at that point. The comment to me illustrated the insular bubble we all not only live in, but we hide in now. I think the most indicting thing I can say about the left is the same thing I would say about the right. And that is an unwillingness to even hear the other side out, even when it's reasonably presented as well as Tim uh, Alberta did in his book and in his presentation. If, if, if left-wing people who vote for Democrats and consider themselves to be ethically superior, perhaps, and morally superior to right-wing people, are not even willing to listen to someone like Tim Alberta and hear the best, most honest presentation of Christianity that I've heard in a long time, both in my podcast with him, but also in his book, The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory, then these folks are as close-minded as any Trumper and as dangerous to our political survival as a nation. So one of the things that Ernie, Greg, my producer, and I have done is make a conscious decision, and this is part of my Christmas sermon, by the way, to open the door in our podcast to people, wait for it, that we disagree with on the opposite side of the spectrum, whether talking about feminism or gay rights or the woke movement or tenure at universities, or controversies, things where we differ from them. And we're trying to find reasonable people like Tim Alberta, for instance, who I disagree with on theology. I am an atheist, but I'm a weird atheist because I'm an atheist who prays, and I describe myself, as I did in one book of mine, as an atheist who believes in God, in other words, juxtaposing opposites and understanding that paradox is where we all really live. But that said, I think that it's really time to talk about the lack of generosity of spirit we all suffer from. We have all painted ourselves into an ideological corner. Now, I did a commentary a little while back in my little It Has to Be Said series. And by the way, please subscribe to Substack and my It Has to Be Read series. We've started a book club. Tim's book is one of the books in the club. And we have some other wonderful books that we're going to be talking about. Some we, quote, agree with, some we disagree with, none that we agree with completely, none that we disagree with completely. Um, but my point is that 
in the new year as we go into 2024, which is going to be the most fraught year any of us have ever experienced politically, where this demagogue horror of Donald Trump is running again for the presidency, followed by people who can only be described as something like a religious cult, a political religious cult that is really reminiscent as Tim Alberta makes the point in The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory of the National Socialist Movement and the rise of fascism in Europe of the 1930s. This is not a stretch. This is literal. But at the same time, we're dealing with closed-minded liberals on the left of the sort that circle the wagons around certain issues of diversity and inclusion and who justly should be parodied for their closed-minded stupidity when they pass over a qualified white older candidate who's teaching history somewhere because this person does not fit their idea of what diversity looks like. And so they'd rather have a lesser quality and lesser qualified person teaching who fits their idea of inclusion and diversity. This way also lies death. And so what I see forming is not a kind of a moral equivalence. The fascist, neoconservative, conservative, right wing led by Donald Trump at this point, their bottomless stupidity, the conspiracy movements they believe in are nakedly evil. So we have a nakedly evil right wing movement that deals in a tissue of nothing but lies and bigotry. But opposing that movement is a left wing and a liberal movement that is also closed minded to its detriment and follows these weird ideas of diversity, inclusion, racial parity, gender issues, pronouns, and all the rest with a kind of a religious intolerance that reminds me of my evangelical background that I fled when I became more progressive. Here's my little Christmas sermon. What both lack is the humanity that I experienced in that little evangelical community my parents started that was filled with people they disagreed with, who loved being there because my parents were better people than their theology. I will repeat that. Their theology was absolutist, doctrinaire, evangelical, Protestant, reformed, Calvinist theology that if you understand those terms, you will know this is rigid. And yet they welcomed what in those days we called unwed mothers. And my mom would go to the hospital with young women who had gotten pregnancy outside of wedlock, as we put it in those days, and help them deliver their babies. And they would live with us sometimes for years because my parents' generosity did not stop at trying to condemn people whose lifestyle, quote unquote, they disagreed with. My father had a couple of co-workers living in our chalet who were lesbians back in the day when this, we're talking the late 1950s and early 1960s, when it was out of context, even in so-called liberal circles. And yet he was open and didn't judge people. They were better than their theology. My parents' theology was harsh and exclusionary, but before they got into the politics of the 1970s and 80s that moved to the hard right because of the anti-abortion movement, they as human beings were open and generous. So I grew up hearing discussions on Saturday evening in the Libri Fellowship context where my dad would answer questions from atheists, agnostics, Jews, gay people, people living in quote unquote homosexual relationships that other Christian ministries would have kicked out in a heartbeat. Students who had fled evangelical colleges like Wheaton College and Gordon College and Bob Jones University and these other places because of the harshness of the reception they had gotten to when they started asking honest questions about why should I believe any of this or had left their faith. And some of them came back to Christianity because of my parents and some did not, but they all left as friends with my mom and dad. And I left the evangelical movement, as I talk about in my memoir, Crazy for God, not because of the fact that I had had some failure of faith or was bitter or didn't love my parents, but precisely because I was comparing the big time American God machine that I encountered in Pat Robertson or Roberts, all these other figures in the 70s and 80s, 
Jerry Falwell and others, President Ford, Ronald Reagan, the way he cashed in on the groups we had helped form, and these others. It was hard-ass politics all the way down, and these were mean people in love with power, egomaniacs, greedy. Some of them were real con artists, like Pat Robertson, or today is the case with Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, a hard-right, neo-fascistic Christian nationalist. These people would string up gay people and trans people. They would have them hanged. They believe in the Old Testament law, or at least they believe in the politics of power and will use anything that comes to hand, including the Bible, to justify themselves, as my friend Tim Alberta has said in The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory. And so my Christmas sermon is just as Tim appeals to follow Jesus in a way that has been lost. And some of my more liberal listeners say, well, at that point, I quit listening because that's disrespectful to other religions. Sorry. You really should listen to people you disagree with. You should have finished the interview. It was a good one. And the book is great and deserves your reading, whether you like his theology or not unless you don't want to understand America today, and have just written off the other side and said, we're not even talking to them. It's time for enlightened liberals tenured in universities, making sure they only hire professors that are the right color to fit in with their idea of diversity and inclusion, to understand that there are people out there they disagree with who are the wrong color as far as their new diversity and inclusion program is aiming for. And the same with the publishing industry, by the way, and others. To imitate what my parents did in Libri Fellowship, not the theology, but the openness. We can get there. We need real diversity and inclusion. And that means listening to people you disagree with. That means not being open to their fantasies and their conspiracy theories and their hatred. I'm not talking about the crazy MAGA Trumpers who will never be convinced or change anything. I'm talking about the thousands of evangelical pastors still trying to do a good job who will read Tim's book and despair because it's their own right-wing con congregations that are getting them fired, or at least some sliver within the congregation, as Tim talks about in his book with various pastors who have been denounced by people within their own congregations who want only MAGA followers in that congregation and they don't like a pastor who still dares to talk about Jesus and love. But we're doing the same thing on the left. And we are turning left-wing ideas of inclusion and diversity into a joke because they are so nakedly hypocritical because now we've just come up with another exclusionary way of looking at people because of sexual orientation. Or we have our own litmus test and checklist that they have to check off, or we won't hire them to teach history or geography somewhere because they don't fit our idea. And our leading universities are on a cruising, cruising for a bruising, as we would put it, because the right wing is going to make hay out of this hypocrisy. Diversity and inclusion that doesn't actually include everybody anymore because they're so diverse and inclusive, they have to exclude people. This is not going to work. So in a, in, in a weird way at this Christmas, I would say, let's all learn whether we are atheists like I am or believers like my friend Tim Alberta is, but let us all for a moment pause and contemplate the message of New Testament Christianity as it developed. That was truly inclusive, in which there was neither Jew nor Gentile nor male nor female. That was the ideal, however it fell short. It was not about sexual orientation or color. It was not about ideology or who you vote for. But was rather about something I experienced the other day in the local fish market that I go to, to pick up a pound or two of haddock, or maybe splurge and get a couple scallops and cook them for Jeannie, who I've been with for 53 years for a special lunch with a glass of champagne, because hey, it's Christmas time. And 
an older woman, let's say she's probably 60, 65, who I've known for a while, who works there, was standing behind the counter. And I said to her, how you doing? And she says, oh, all right. I said, no, no, how are you really doing? And no one else was around. It was great. We could talk for a minute. And she was saying, not very well. My husband's been in the hospital twice this month. And he has cancer and he's on oxygen and at home. And I thought, you know, that was the worst had happened. And then my 14-year-old niece died last week. And between organizing visits for him, driving him in for checkups at the hospital, and helping my sister organize her funeral, it's tough. So, um, you know, we're not supposed to touch people anymore because, you know, whatever reason, but I reached across the counter and took her hand. And I just said, I'm really, really sorry. And we just stood there and talked for a few minutes. And she thanked me for talking to her and caring. We're not friends. We don't know each other. But in that moment, my parents' evangelical Christianity was alive and well. That's how I was raised. This wasn't some new diversity inclusion thing. This wasn't a liberal or conservative. This was human to human. I don't know how she voted, and I don't care. For all I know, her husband's a MAGA Trumper, and I don't care. Because the bottom line is, it's not about who you vote for. It's about the empathy of shared pain and joy. At the end of that time, I said to her, because I was being honest, I said, I don't know what to say. I know it's the holiday season. And she grabbed my hand again and looked in my eyes and said, no matter what's going on, I still want to wish you a Merry Christmas. And she wasn't someone saying that because she's reacting to happy holidays from the point of view of being a Christian. I don't think she is a Christian in the sense my parents would mean it. But she said Merry Christmas in the midst of her suffering to someone who had for a minute stopped to share that suffering. And so I want to say to my Jewish atheist friends, one of whom I interviewed the other day, a wonderful book about her journey to atheism, and I want to say to my evangelical friends, and I want to say to my agnostic friends and to my black friends and my gay friends and my trans friends and to the people I agree with and the people I disagree with, I want to reach out and say to you that in the final analysis, if we were stuck together, individually somewhere, across a fish counter, or on a desert island, or sitting together on an airplane, or maybe in an airport where our flight's been canceled and we got talking. The point is not to live in our isolated ideological bubble where we only hear people who already agree with us and make us comfortable. The point is to reach out and understand that the common human experience of being alive, seeking beauty in our lives, connection, and love, is the only thing that gives meaning to our human rituals, whether they're religious or secular. And that we can take a page from my friend at the fish market, whose husband is on oxygen and has cancer and has been in the hospital twice and whose niece has died, and she needed to leave work early that day to help her sister organize the funeral. But still reached out and said Merry Christmas to me, not as a political or religious statement, but a statement of human solidarity. 
because what we'd each really said to each other is this, and it's the final message I would leave you with at Christmas and New Year and Hanukkah and all our festivals, whether Muslim or Hindu or right wing or left wing. The only real message we're looking at that we need from another human being is this. I see you. My name is Frank Schaefer.